Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the second episode of the, the X plus Y factor. I do very quickly have to uh, say that um, I will put a link to the uh, to Johnny's solution to the problem from last week's episode in the description uh, down below. Um, so that will uh, appear in due course, maybe later today, uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, and so uh, let's get started on this week's episode. So I've got uh, Dr. Bernd Schulter with me. Um, and so first of all, Bernd, can you say a bit about um, uh, what you do in the department, what you teach and so on, and what your research area is. Uh, sure, yeah. Hi, I'm Bernd. Um, I uh, came to Lancaster about eight years ago. Um, I am now teaching Math 101, which is uh, calculus, uh, one of the first modules students take here when they come to Lancaster. And I also teach an optional third year course, which is combinatorics. Um, and this relates quite strongly to my to my research. So I work in in combinatorics and and a field called discrete geometry. Okay, I think you've got a you've got a, a sort of a model that that, uh, that we'll yeah. see a little bit of later. Which right. Is, uh, so uh, one of my uh, specialties is to study uh, the rigidity and flexibility of structures with finitely many geometric components. Um, so what you see here is a tensegrity structure. Um, so it consists of, of stiff bars, as you can see, uh, and cables, and they're joined up uh, by, by these joints here. And well, this structure uh, looks nice. I mean, there are bars that are not uh, touching each other. They're only connected by cables, and it's nice and stiff. Uh, so this is an example of a structure that, that we study. Uh, and these things have lots of applications in engineering and, and biology and other fields. Okay, and just to give due credit, Tensegrity is a company that produces these uh, sort of little kits that you, uh, where you have to put all the bars together in the right arrangement. Yeah. That is correct, but you can also That's make it. your own models, yeah. You can <laughs> make your own, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, just to make sure that uh, we've got the appropriate intellectual property uh, sort of uh, recognised there. Yeah. Um, now, you uh, you mentioned um, that you uh, teach um, at the beginning of, of term. So last week we had uh, Johnny Evans on, and he uh, teaches one of the last courses in the academic year that uh, that our department teaches, which is linear algebra for the first year. So at the beginning of the summer term, so he was teaching uh, right at the peak of the lockdown, uh, and we talked a bit last week about what he did in terms of online teaching and so on. Now you teach uh, this uh, one on one. Um, it's it's just called calculus, I think, or is it differentiation? No, it's just calculus. Calculus, yeah. And this is the, the one of the first uh, modules that we take in the teach in the first that the department teaches in the first five weeks of term. Um, so obviously there are a lot of questions about how we're going to be teaching. We've been having meetings in the department. We've been having discussions about what we're going to be doing. Um, so have you, have you had any thoughts over how, how you're going to teach that? What uh, what form the course will take? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, maybe I should uh, first mention what I would normally do if there there's no uh, difficulties with social distancing. Uh, so normally we have uh, lectures in the classroom, of course, um, I prepare uh, lecture notes with gaps for that, um, and I fill the gaps during the lectures, so this is a little bit interactive. Um, and then we have workshop sessions where the students are split into smaller groups, um, and in these workshop sessions we go through problems um, and discuss questions students might have about the material. Uh, now, I plan to do the same if there's uh, no issues uh, with uh, the coronavirus. Um, but of course, we should uh, prepare for all uh, possibilities. So I have been thinking about uh, what I would do if, uh, well, we have to teach online. And I do plan to uh, go with the flipped teaching approach that uh, Johnny Evans was talking about mm -hmm. last week. I quite like that. Uh, so I do plan to uh, prepare lectures um, and post them online, and then uh, use the uh, you know the standard uh, scheduled lecture slots to have more interactive live sessions. Um, it's not completely clear yet how these live sessions will be run. Uh, so as you said, we have meetings about this now on a weekly basis. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to. I select a few problems 
um, rather than giving the students a whole list. Um, just focus on, on some key questions and then try to um, engage all students if possible in uh, discussions, maybe in the chat uh, or in some other form. So this needs a bit more thought, um, mm -hmm. but we're, we're, we're on the case, I think. So I think we will be well prepared when the time comes. Yeah, I think we discussed all of the all of the benefits that you would get from the normal sort of workshops and being there uh, in yeah. person. Um, and we understand that some some students will probably decide not to move to Lancaster. Uh, they might study uh, at home uh, with their parents. Um, and so we need to make provision for them. It should be accessible for them them to to learn. Still, if we are running online events, we still want students to be able to interact with each other, and we don't want things to get to sort of um, routine. Uh, so we kind of talked about various different ways of kind of freshening up, having sort of a, an assessment every few weeks and so on. And um, yeah, it's it's not easy, is it, to sort of think about uh, how to benefit all of the students in a way uh, that is best for them, because obviously, you know, some students uh, prefer to talk to somebody else. You know, they really learn more in the sort of conversation that others you know, are happy if they're doing stuff on screen on their own or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's a lot of planning going into it. It's going to be quite a busy summer. So, um, yeah. 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 Um, One thing I will do is uh, to still give the students all the workshop exercises we would normally give them. Um, and they can uh, work on this in their own time at home and they can see the solutions online. Uh, but in addition to that, of course, we want to have this interactive uh, uh, type of teaching as well, because as you said, a lot of students learn uh, very well with that. Um, so yeah, we're, we're discussing options and uh, I'm sure we will find uh, a nice solution for that. Now, can I just um, ask um, a little bit about the content? It's called Calculus. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you sort of briefly say what's, what's in the module? Sure, yes. Uh, so yes, it's calculus. So we will go through the main topics of calculus, um, which you probably have heard of before from A-levels. So continuity of real valued functions, um, derivatives, um, how to compute derivatives, um, uh, integration, of course. Um, so these are the, key, the core topic, topics, I would say. Uh, in addition, there are a few additional uh, uh, topics we talk about, such as complex numbers, uh, Taylor series, uh, proofs by induction. Uh, so by the end of the course, I think um, everybody will be on the same page uh, in terms of background for, for further calculus uh, courses. Um, so I, I should say that a lot of the material uh, may sound familiar to students, but there is a key difference to A-levels, namely that we start with more mathematical rigor right from the start. Um, so we introduce notions such as continuity with proper mathematical definitions. And um, we make that shift a little bit from um, just method-based uh, learning to, to more conceptual uh, proof-based learning. Yeah, I think I think that um, about a year ago uh, we sort of had meetings where we discussed the changes to A level that had happened um, as a result of the reforms to A level and, and mathematics. So the 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 first year this year was the first cohort of students who took the reformed A level in mathematics. Um, mm -hmm. So at that stage we said, uh, well, the, there's a bit more uniformity of the content of mathematics and further mathematics A level. So we could consider revising our first year. You know, whereas previously we used to have to sort of take people who've done with. A level with NXL and other people who've done it with one of the other exam boards, we need to get them all to the same level. And the new A level, it looked like we could actually sort of cut out perhaps some material, but that's been blown out of the water by coronavirus. So um, we sort of left it for a year to see how things uh, kind of bedded in. And then I think the next year's first year, well, we're looking at people who haven't done uh, the A-level maths exam, so they've only been assessed on the coursework, and uh, I think we'll push that back for another year. In fact, we've completely forgotten about it, but that was something that we were discussing, yeah. was sort of just modifying the first year to make, uh, you know, to, to take advantage of the fact that everybody's done sort of roughly the same content um, when they did A-level maths. Um, so, uh, so it's sort of easing people into the into the university maths with a little bit of a difference of style, 
Um, it runs concurrently with this other module, um, numbers and relations, um, which is sort of more different in style to A-level maths, certainly different in content. Um, so you've kind of got the, the familiar and the not so familiar, and you're in the familiar side, aren't you, in the Math 100? Yes, that's right. But as I said, uh, so we introduced some of the notions a bit more rigorously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there will also be some new material. It will not all be yeah. known. And and it's followed by uh, a module I used to teach. Uh, is is it called further calculus or integration? Yeah. 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 Um, so we just know numbers. We don't necessarily remember the names of the of the modules. So now you also teach a, a module on combinatorics in the third year, don't you? Um, yes, correct. So that's uh, closer to your research area. And how how long? I think that's maybe three or four years. But that's it's longer than that, maybe five or six or so. Um, but it's a relatively new module. Um, and just two years or th maybe three years ago, we introduced another module in discrete mathematics, which is graph theory. Um, so that uh, is taught right before my module. Um, so they form a sort of mini stream in discrete mathematics, if you like. And both courses are, are very relevant to, to my research. And so these are optional modules that uh, students can take at the third year. Um, yes, that's correct. Um, so, um, and they're both pretty popular, I think. Uh, we tend to look at enrollment numbers as a sort of sign of success of, uh, yes. of these modules, yeah. Yeah, it's been very successful, I think, yeah. Yeah, both consistently done done pretty well. So, so that's definitely a good addition to our sort of undergraduate curriculum over the last few years, and it shows the way that research interests of people in the department actually have a direct impact on yes. uh, the curriculum. I just uh, need to sell things a little bit, so I thought I'd mention that. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a fun course that deals with lots of different topics in, in uh, discrete mathematics and graph theory and counting and so on. Um, and again, it, it leads uh, into the type of research that, that I do and that other people in the department do. Right. Okay, um, now you are also currently the part one director of studies in the department. Um, um, so can you just sort of explain roughly what that role is and what it, what you do as part of it? Yeah, sure. So I've had this role uh, for quite some time now, ever since I arrived here uh, about eight years ago. Um, so the role involves basically uh, taking care of our first year students. Uh, so that involves, um, well, answering questions that students may have about their a degree program. Um, it means that I uh, monitor uh, attendance and coursework submissions of our first year students to see if uh, there are any students who are struggling um, with you know, difficulties with work or maybe illnesses, uh, mental health, personal issues, whatever a life may have thrown at students. Um, and when we find that students are struggling, then um, well, we try to assist them as, as much as we can. Uh, if, it's, if it's health issues and so on, of course, we cannot help ourselves, but then we direct them to the right places. Um, if it's difficulties with work, um, we come up with plans how to, how to uh, improve their academic standing and their performance. Uh, so yeah, overall, uh, just taking care of, of all our students and making sure that, that everybody is, is reaching their, their best potential. And uh, we have been taking this very, very seriously in the department. Yeah, so uh, all students get an academic tutor when they arrive, and this is slightly different to the academic tutor role, isn't it? It's more sort of top level, um, kind of program level, um, and you're also, as a result of that, on the teaching committee, um, yeah. and so you sort of have an input into the changes to the program, all kinds of things that are invisible to most students, but uh, but actually are part of uh, what we need to do to make sure the program is successful. And I communicate quite a bit with our academic tutors uh, when there are students who are struggling with, with whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you're um, you're going to be uh, changing roles um, from uh, August, I believe. You're going to become part of the admissions team. So yes, that's correct. That's... There will be a new role for me. So. Um... Oh, the transition. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe something that people don't sort of realize that there are a lot of sort of different things that need doing in a department, what we call admin, which is kind of like roles where you have to, you know, um, 
fill in, fill in paperwork or you know do admissions or uh, you know look at the kind of top level consideration of exams and so on and academics move between these things over the course of a number of years so um, you're going to be moving away from part one director studies which you've done for quite a while so uh, it's probably good for you to freshen things up a bit isn't it yes that's right i have to i've liked to do this role though it's, it's been fun to, to work with your yeah. students and and to get them acclimatized to the university life yeah so was there any sort of particularly urgent business that you had to take care of as part one director during the, the sort of lockdown and the planning that we've had since then? Um, yes, I mean, it was quite a challenge uh, in terms of uh, organizational issues. Uh, so as you know, we had to move from uh, sort of standard regular teaching to online teaching very quickly. Um, luckily, the lecturers were, were very good in making this transition, so that made our lives much easier. Um, but there were issues to take care of. For example, uh, uh, marking assignments online takes significantly more time than marking uh, assignments that you have in front of you on paper. Uh, we did not want to uh, overwork our, our teaching assistants, so we had to make adjustments to the, to the assessments and reduce the, the, the number of questions. Um, so yes, so yeah, sir. Just to clarify, so the, so the assessments for those courses that were still ongoing for, for, for part one were just changed slightly so the, the, the students had to submit them online. That's right, yeah, which was another issue we had to take care of. So we had to uh, yeah. instruct students how to submit and how to submit uh, things in such a way that uh, teaching assistants can read the solutions well. Yeah, there's a lot of communication with students. That had to be taken care of, yeah. And um, and of course the um, the there were sort of issues around kind of tests. So in the first year we have these end of module tests that uh, that happen each five weeks. But also there are questions around the exams, and normally the exams would take place right now actually. Um, and so uh, I think the tests were moved to be online tests. Is That's that right. right. So usually it's just a one hour or 45 minute test. Um, so that was replaced with uh, an online assignment that was open for 48 hours. Um, so a take home exam, if you like. Uh, and we had to arrange that on a fairly short notice, but I think it has worked quite, quite well. Um, and, the, and the exams were uh, sort of um, kind of canceled, right? I mean, yes, they were, they were canceled. Uh, I think this, uh, this was a good decision, in my opinion. Uh, I think it put a lot of students at ease. Um, I, I did have to deal with, with quite a few students who were put in difficult situations because of the pandemic. Um, and uh, it helped uh, that, you know, the exams <laughs> were, were, were right. cancelled and uh, that we were also quite lenient uh, on missed work or waiving missed work or, or extending coursework uh, deadlines and so on. So normally the, um, the the marks would be sort of computed at the end of the year and then you have a meeting where you have to decide whether students can progress from the first year to the second year, from part one to part two. Yes, that is correct. Uh, now everybody, almost everybody, uh, except for some, some uh, well, special cases, they progress automatically. Um, nevertheless, uh, there will be marks that will be computed based on coursework. Um, and I think the university has not made a final decision yet whether these marks will appear on transcripts or not. So we will have to see how that goes. But basically, everybody uh, progresses to part two automatically. Right. So the question of moving to the second, the current current first years, they are uh, <laughs> sort of they're, they're in the clear. They they can yeah. go through to the second year. Um, yes. they're, they're no, sort of no questions. Next year, of course, it's going to be quite different. We will have time to plan. Yeah. Um, I think the likelihood is it appears that we probably won't have exams in the summer either next year. Um, so uh, yeah. I think and we still haven't decided what's going to happen with assessments because uh, yes. there are all kinds of considerations. But it, it seems likely that coursework will be a bigger proportion will have to be a bigger proportion than it, than it would normally be. I think so, yeah. That is that is very likely to happen. Okay, so that, that's the message that uh, people can take that if you, yeah, that it looks like it's coursework is going to be the, the kind of the, the main way that we assess you, uh, at least for the next academic year. Yeah. Uh, we may go back to normal after that, but um, yeah. Um, okay, um, so uh, now we, we're going to have an interlude, uh, which is for you to introduce um, 
a problem um, that you uh, have already chosen. We had a bit of a chat about it in advance. Um, uh, so um, I think you can do some sort of screen share similar to, to Johnny last uh, last week. So take yeah. it away. Yeah, sure. Let me try to do that. Um, so while I try to set this up here, um, let me just say again. So I work in discrete geometry, and a specialty of mine um, is to study the rigidity and flexibility uh, of uh, structures uh, that model real world structures. So this could be um, mechanical linkages, robotic arms, um, you know, buildings made made of uh, struts and uh, uh, joints, or it could be uh, biological structures like like molecules or crystals and so on. Um, so let me pose uh, some questions. Um, that relate to this. Um, so one classical structure that we study in our research is a so-called bar join framework. Um, so this is, is a structure, I will draw some pictures in a second, um, that consists of rigid bars. So they have a fixed length and they are joined at the ends by, by joints that allow bending in any direction of the given space. And the question is whether such structures are rigid or flexible uh, in the sense that they allow a non-trivial deformation. So this uh, I can illustrate nicely with some pictures. So let me focus just on dimension two. You can study uh, this in higher dimensions as well, but uh, let's just keep it nice and easy and look at structures in the plane. So here is a an illustration of a bar joint framework in the plane. I hope you can see this. Mm -hmm. um, so there are four bars. Uh, I think of this as stri straight line segments of a fixed length. So they are stiff bars. And they are joined at the ends by these, well, in the plane, just pin joints, if you like. And these pins can move around freely. Um, and, well, up to the constraints given by these fixed length bars. So the question is, is such a structure rigid or flexible? Um, so let me say a bit more about that. This structure turns out to be flexible because um, we can keep the bottom bar here fixed and then shear the top bar something like this preserving all the edge length, but changing the different the distance between a pair of unconnected joints, right? So um, this is a deformation of the original framework, it gives us a new framework, this blue one here. Um, and all the length of the edges are still the same, but the distance between these two vertices along a diagonal here has changed now. So this is what we call uh, a non-trivial deformation of a flex. So this framework would be flexible. Let me draw you a rigid framework. So the easiest example maybe is just a triangle. So here all pairs of vertices are actually connected and there is no deformation uh, that you can do with this, no internal deformation at least. Um, you can always take the structure and rotate the whole thing around, or you can translate it uh, around as a whole, uh, but these we consider trivial motions. So uh, what we're looking for are non-trivial or, or internal deformations. So let me draw just one more example, just to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So here's another bar joint framework in the plane. Um, let me start again with this quadrilateral here. Um, we have seen that it is flexible on the left. We can make this rigid by adding another bar, for example, this one. And then you can fairly easily convince yourself that this is now rigid in the plane. So we have a triangle uh, on the top left here, uh, which we know is rigid. And then we have one more joint here, or vertex, that is joined to this triangle with two more bars and that pins this extra vertex rigidly to this triangle. So if it was only connected with one bar to this triangle, it could still rotate around, but the second bar then uh, fixes it completely. 
I should mention that if you look at this framework uh, as sitting in three-dimensional space, so the space we all live in, then this would not be rigid because you could take one triangle and hold it fixed and rotate the other triangle around the diagonal. So in three dimensions, this would be flexible, but in two dimensions, this is rigid. So maybe uh, let me draw one last example here. So you can look now, of course, at more complicated, whoops, more complicated uh, frameworks. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, where it's not so easy to tell anymore whether it is rigid or not. Um, and that will relate to one of the problems I'll pose in a second. Um, so here I do allow uh, crossings of edges, by the way. So in the plane, if you make your own model, you can use cardboard strips uh, for the bars and uh, split pins for the joints, if you like. And these, these bars or cardboard strips, they can slide over each other. So. Uh, crossings of edges uh, uh, not problematic. And now the question is, well, what about this framework? Is, does this have an internal deformation or a flex, or is it rigid? So these questions are uh, uh, not so easy when the frameworks become larger. Um, you can immediately see that combinatorics plays a role here, uh, because if I give you a certain number of, of joints, vertices, in this case six, then of course, if I only put one or two bars, then this will become very floppy, very flexible, um, right? Uh, and if you put lots and lots of bars, it will become very rigid. Um, and if you just have the right number to be rigid, then you have to make sure that the bars are distributed in the right way. Um, so you don't want all the bars on one side and no bars on the other side of the structure and so on. So clearly there's counting going on, counting of of bars or constraints for a given number of, of joints. Um, and uh, well, this is uh, exactly what combinatorics is about. It turns out that every uh, graph, so what you see here are graphs, you've probably discussed graphs in A-level. Uh, so every graph has a typical behavior in the sense that uh, almost all realizations of a given graph as a bar joint framework are rigid or they are almost all flexible. Uh, and so we can try to characterize graphs that are uh, rigid or flexible in this way. But it is possible for a graph to be rigid for almost all geometric realizations, uh, but flexible for very particular geometric configurations. So there are special positions where, where flexibility may arise that you don't expect, and there are special uh, configurations in, in flexible structures uh, where all of a sudden you have a rigid structure. So this is where the geometry comes in um, and that makes things also quite interesting. So let me go to my uh, problems now. Um, so the first, well, actually before I, I, I talk about the problems, let me give you a slightly more formal definition of a bar joint framework. Um, so we can think of it as a pair GP, where G is just a graph, okay? So it has a set of vertices, we call V and a set of edges, E, and P is a map that assigns to every vertex of the graph a point in, in the plane. Okay, so this is exactly what we have been doing in these, in these pictures here, right? We have taken the graph, but we have also actually drawn the graph in the plane, so we have chosen positions for the vertices. And we always assume that the edges are straight uh, line segments. Okay, so this is what I call a framework. Okay, first question. Uh, can you find a planar framework? So that means that no edges are allowed to cross. Okay, it's not so easy to write on this actually. Mm -hmm. Here, just abbreviate this. So can you find a planar GP? I hope you can still see what I'm drawing here. It's so, yeah. Okay, where you have six vertices, just like in the picture on the bottom there, um, and nine edges. and it should be flexible. Okay, so flex. 
Okay, I will not write it all out because it's a bit uh, difficult to draw here. Okay, I hope that question is clear. So I'm looking for a graph with six vertices, uh, nine edges. The edges have to be uh, drawn uh, as straight line segments. They have a fixed length, and the framework should be planar, so no edges are crossing. All right, so the examples on the top here are planar. The one on the bottom is not. And it should be flexible. Uh, that's the first challenge. Second challenge, I'm looking again for a planar framework. Again, same number of vertices and edges. Well, actually, let me this time choose just eight edges. So we have less constraints. Can you nevertheless make it rigid? So can you find a graph with six vertices, eight edges, planar that is actually rigid. So it does not have an internal deformation. And as a bonus question in the very end, if you like, um, you can consider the graph on the bottom here. So these two triangles uh, that are connected with these three additional edges. Can you find a realization of this graph as a bar joint framework in the plane? Um, this time not necessarily planar, so edges are allowed to cross. Uh, which flexes. So the structure I've drawn here actually is rigid, um, but there is uh, a way to draw the, this to, to uh, obtain a flexible framework. So this is a, a slightly more difficult question, I think. Yeah, I think that's that's all. Okay, thank you. So 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 when you you said something about a sort of geometric uh, was it realization? What was the words? Yes, yeah, so I just, yeah, that's right. So I have a graph and a realization. I just mean that I pick positions for the vertices in the plane. Right. So you, essentially, you would have a, a sort of a structure where the, the vertices uh, and edges are kind of the same, but with different positions for the vertices. Is that? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. OK. And then so different, yeah, yeah. different ways of doing that give you different geometric realizations of the same of the same graph. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you may have this very special geometry for the realization or for the position of the vertices that gives rise to additional flexibility. Yeah. Or the structure may all of a sudden become rigid. These things are, of course, very important for applications uh, when you uh, build a bridge or something like that or a structure that, that should hold up. Then you don't want to build it uh, in a bad configuration where, where it becomes floppy. Um, uh, and of course, you can imagine many other applications. Yeah, uh, so I guess that that's where um, your your subject kind of crosses over, and so the the graph where you don't consider the geometry of the sort of positions of the different um, vertices that's that's combinatorics, right? That's really discrete yeah. mathematics. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the sort of thing that you might study in graph theory in in the in the module that you uh, that you teach. Yes. Exactly. In third year, but then the different positions, that's the geometric side of things, isn't it? And you've got that's to bring right. some other methods from different bits of mathematics to try and understand that. That's right. So one of my specialties is, is to look at uh, structures with symmetry, which you see a lot in engineering structures and in biological structures. Mm. And symmetry, of course, gives you special geometric positions. Uh, and the question is, when does the symmetry induce additional flexibility that you may not expect? Uh, and things like group representation theory, which is another optional third year module in our program, um, becomes relevant uh, and, and other uh, mathematical uh, um, tools. So group theory in general, which we have quite a few modules about, uh, are, be are becoming quite relevant for this. Yes, yeah, so the representation theory of finite groups is a, um, is a current third year module, uh, and we have some plans from uh, 20, I need to get the year right, so any student coming in now will be doing their third year in 22, 23. So I think from 2023, we will have a, uh, possibly have some sort of optional uh, kind of switches where you can do representation theory of finite groups, or you can do representation theory of something else. So just, just to clarify that for the, for the marketing purposes, but uh, we'll have all, all of the correct information on the, on the website. Um, so um, I think we've sort of already kind of discussed a little bit uh, uh, your uh, your research. Um, uh, I 
we'll make sure that a, a sort of a PDF version of that uh, that problem is uh, is posted on the on the web page. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, I don't know if there's um, uh, anything else you want to say about next year. Um, no, I'm quite looking forward to it. Uh, we will have to see uh, what kind of teaching we'll have to do. Um, we would definitely plan for for all possibilities. Um, yeah. And I think if we do have to do online teaching, um, we will make it a success uh, because we have we have time now to prepare for it, and we have intensive uh, discussions of the department now on a regular basis. Um, so I think we'll be ready for this. <laughs> well, I have the advantage that I'm teaching in the long term um, uh, on the undergraduate program. Uh, after Christmas, but then also I'm teaching this graduate course on the what's called the magic system uh, before Christmas. So I get to try out some of the online teaching uh, methods first, whereas you're really at the front line of uh, Lancaster University of the, the maths department, maths and stats department. You're, uh, you're teaching in, in 101. That's really kind of like the first experience that our students will have of how this uh, teaching is going to work. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it's something that we're all sort of uh, kind of thinking about together, aren't we? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so okay, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, just a, a reminder to, to tune in uh, next week or to, to watch next week uh, to anybody that's, uh, that's watched this far in the video. Uh, we'll have uh, Mark MacDonald, who's the head of uh, the director of undergraduate teaching, uh, is going to be on uh, next week. So he'll have some more sort of program level things to say, as well as some observations about his teaching. So, so thank you very much, Bernd. And, sure, thank uh, you. I'll see you at the meeting uh, later this week uh, where we talk about our plans for teaching uh, and uh, everybody else I'll uh, hopefully see you next week. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.